Well, first of all, welcome. And I'm glad everybody got coffee because it's been a quiet morning so far. And it's time to wake up. Um, I'm going to play a video as well, but completely different than the one you saw. Because my job as a MySpace person is to somewhat entertain you while we're talking about safety. But before I do that, I want to just give you a little bit of perspective on what MySpace is. And we are going to be talking a lot about the safety and how the site works and things like that. Um, and right before getting into that, let me just put in perspective who not just MySpace is, but what News Corporation is. News Corporation actually created an internet division called Fox Interactive Media. That internet division acquired a bunch of companies and created new companies. And it is, in essence, where MySpace sits, along with AmericanIdol.com, Fox.com, FoxSports.com. There's a bunch of sites out there that all fall under the umbrella of, of Fox Interactive Media, which is a News Corp property. Um, it's often been said, MySpace is a social networking site. And I think I can tell you all today, we are not just a social networking site. We're actually a social media portal. When the site started by our founders, Tom and Chris, uh, five years ago now, their idea was connect fans to bands. And that eventually evolved into people connecting with people, people connecting with each other, they're sharing their lives, and that then connected with the portal. So now MySpace is, in essence, a social media portal with all the amenities of a portal that you get on any portal out there, plus the ability to connect with people, consume content, connect with culture, and find new things that we're developing constantly. Um, and just to put it in perspective on where we are today, and then I'm sure we can talk about later where we're headed, as I think you're going to hear about MySpace uh, music soon enough, and you've been hearing about it in the press, but we're headed in a whole new direction from what I think people are often thinking of us when we talk about MySpace. So let me play a video and close your ears, because it's going to be exciting. And I know maybe three people in this video. Hello, my name is Borat. I only a second Kazaki man ever on my spaces. Raise your hand if you're on myspace.com. I'm on myspace. Isn't everybody on myspace? From Hollywood, it's Jimmy Kimmel. But you've got like 1.2 million friends, according to um, your MySpace that is page, true. and those people can't all be your friends. They are all my friends. No, they're not all your friends. In fact, these people here, they're all in MySpace, and I know everything there is to know. One of the best ways that you keep growing as a band to stay in touch with uh, your fan base. Everyone tells me get on MySpace, and now I'm officially addicted. Just for Laughs is the biggest comedy extravaganza in the entire world. Now, what do you think of MySpace, Jason? MySpace, you have taken over the world. It used to be MTV. Yes. No longer. Now it's you. Be the first to see a sneak peek of The Office. My God. Log on to MySpace.com Wednesday at 8 Eastern. Do you think that the, the technology plays a, a role in that? No question about it, because the communication uh, ability now with the with the internet with the venues like MySpace. These days, the internet is where it's at. MySpace.com has launched a massive drive to sign up new voters. Registration forms are just a click away. I'm sure a lot of you are saying, I didn't really need coffee, did I? Um, just to add some more perspective to this, there are 78% of the moms out there are online today. 48% or nearly half of those are on MySpace. Um, 
and our largest growing population is actually 35 to 42 years of age. We are around the world, 122 million users around the world. We continue to grow every day. So we, everything we do, we think about it from a scale and uh, worldwide perspective. Just some, just some straight numbers for you. 20 million images are uploaded on the site daily on the weekends after people go out and um, take more photos with their digital cameras. That number can sometimes shoot up to 30 million. About 25, 125 billion impressions a month as of, as a, about a month ago, so I'm sure that number's gone up a little bit now. On the video side, about 105,000 videos are uploaded daily. So this should just give you an impression of what we're thinking about, looking at, dealing with when we think about safety and security. Um, it's also a place where a lot of amazing things are happening, a place where we call a place for impact. So somewhere about 100,000 social causes have shown up on the site, set up a home, and are using it to connect with their constituents, to advocate for their causes. Um, recently, we launched My Debates with the Presidential Debates Com uh, Commission. First time ever, you're going to see presidential debates go from the, the television medium to also the online medium. We also got a call, I think I got a call from uh, Oprah's safety lawyer about a week and a half, two weeks ago, saying, hey, there's a legislation in Congress right now. We need it to pass. We need your help to get people on MySpace to be calling their senators, calling and saying, get the PROTECT Act passed. We set up a site over the weekend, launched it on Monday, right before her show aired, and where she did exactly the same thing. It's also a place where we're providing crisis communication capabilities to the government and to universities in the country. Got a call from uh, Secretary Chertoff's office. Um, just when Hurricane Gustav was coming, and they said, how do we get information to people if the telephone lines go down, if other things go down, there might be internet access, which was actually a surprise, and it, and it was a surprise that happened due to the power of Microsoft, my former company, um, where they got the internet up and running people. And then there's also a lot of people around the world and country that want to know what's going on with my family and friends in there. People want to connect, they want to donate money, they want to get information in real time, so we created a widget specifically for DHS, launched it on our site, and put it out to our users through an announcement that went out to every user through our, our founder, Tom Anderson. University of or Florida State University created a system on the site that says when something bad happens, whether it's a gun shooting or some other emergency, they can put out information to their users, not just the students, but also to the family and friends of those students by launching a site on the site, I mean, on our site. And this is also something we're working with UCLA. Stanford reached out to us recently to start a communication in that area. We're going to find ways to expand this around the country. It's also a place for crisis intervention. We worked with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and said, you know, those Amber Alerts on the highway, how do we get them online? Since we launched about a year and a half ago, the Amber Alert program on the site, it's had 463 million impressions. So every time you see an Amber Alert, when you're driving in that highway, in the region you're in, based on what the National Center tells us, those alerts show up on that region on MySpace. Suicide, that's a major part of our program where we're relying on our users to let us know, hey, I think there's a friend of mine who's threatening suicide or somebody who calls us. We institute an emergency response system. We reach out to the suicide um, prevention hotline. And on top of that, we also call law enforcement in that region and say, somebody needs to get to the house of this individual, find out who they are, get them help, and save lives. So given all that, that is what MySpace is today. How do we, take safe, or how do we approach safety? Um, I created this, what's now known in our own company as My House Slide. But overall, I spent 18 years doing safety and security. I started in the um, LADA's office as a, as a prosecutor and then went to the federal side, prosecuted internet child porn cases, internet predator cases, computer crime cases, as well as the physical world, um, baby rapes and adult rapes and murders and gang cases. Then headed off to the movie industry and internet enforcement and then Microsoft where we took that perspective of safety and security in the legal side and translated it into business impact and how do we create, for example, Vista with family safety settings or Xbox Live with safety settings and things like that. Looking back on the last 18 years, I've probably touched every one of these areas that is in this slide. And when we look at safety and security, I spend my hours trying to figure out how to create a safe and secure environment. 
and bringing these seven different areas to the forefront. <coughs> so our approach, we build safety into MySpace, safety features into MySpace, and then we partner with our um, safety advocates, law enforcers, educators, policymakers, um, and get to a point where we reduce it down to three Cs. And one of the things you heard, I think, in the last day, day and a half, and actually you've heard if you're a task force member over the last six months, is what is the problem we're trying to solve? Because you can't implement anything unless you answer that core critical question first. And at MySpace, we looked at that and we said, well, number one issue that we want to tackle, one of our challenges, is preventing access to inappropriate content. We don't allow nudity, hate speech, extreme violence, drug paraphernalia, all sorts of things on the site. How do we prevent access to it and how do we prevent it in the first place? Number two, contact. Not contact between anyone, but unwanted contact between an adult and a teen. How do we make that happen? How do we find solutions that will impact that area and solve those issues? And then finally, collaboration. We need to make sure that everybody understands we are a technology company connected to social media. Our job is to build technology, build new, and new ideas, new channels, and then we focus on how do we partner with the experts when something does go wrong, law enforcement, safety advocates, law enforcers, policy makers. We have to find ways to collaborate to bring the holistic approach to life, which means it takes an entire community to make these things happen. So looking first at content, we approach this in multiple layers. One is content on the site. Now, rather than relying just on users, and actually I'm going to go back a slide just to explain this a little bit better. I put up here a new paradigm. And the reason I did that was when I was at DOJ about in 97 to 2000, we used to meet with a lot of internet companies. And one of the things we always heard was, well, notify us of an issue. When our users tell us, we will take care of the problem. And it was also always presented as, this is what we call zero tolerance. Well, I think the industry has actually moved beyond that, and we're setting the way for the industry to move beyond that. And it's what we're calling now a new paradigm is emerging, which is don't just do notice and takedown, but merge it and combine it with proactive measures that you're taking as a company to identify the issue, prevent the issue, and take action very quickly before your own user calls you. That should be the ultimate goal. Take care of it before you get the call from a user or an email or a complaint. Um, so in order to make that happen, every image on the site, we're trying to find ways to review that, all the videos that get uploaded. And I know a lot of people have asked, well, how do you get the videos? You can't watch them many hours. Um, but what we've decided to do using our technology engineers, and actually our uh, head of our product, safety and security product team is here watching because she was looking at all the uh, presentations yesterday to see what might be out there that we can implement. Um, we take a video, we strip it down into 15 stills, and then we give our staff the ability to look at all that, and if there's something they want to pursue further, they can, or they can delete the video. Same thing with images. They have screens to look at. They mark it very quickly. We ask people to be overly cautious. If you're not sure, mark it. An in-house manager is going to then make a final decision on it. Discussion groups. We went to law enforcement and we said, give us all the keywords that bad guys are using out there. Whether it's a child pornographer, it's somebody engaged in some other type of misconduct, and let us run those keywords against our site in these discussion groups area, looking for something that might be popping up, and before some bad thing event or bad event happens, we need to get in there, take care of it, delete it. And if necessary, report to law enforcement. And the red words, I'm, I actually made them a little lighter because they are pretty graphic words, but they're up on the screen. Another thing we do, not just on content on the site, and I think uh, Donna Rice was asking this question about linking and things like that. We look at people and we say, well, they may want to link out to this from the site or they want to bring in content from another site and make it appear on our site. We've created what we call our blacklist, where if it's a phishing site, if it's a porn site, if it's a some sort of malicious virus site, it goes into the, uh, the blacklist. If you link to it or try to bring it into the site, that code gets disabled. It sends you back to the home page. So uPorn is a perfect example. I tried this on our site. You can't get it up there. 
but you can try other sites out there who aren't using proactive tools and doing blacklists and things like that, you can easily put it up there so an individual on another site can easily go to that. But if you try this, it'll go send you right back to the home page. Another thing we consider at all times on this site is our users, which I think a lot of people may have a misconception, and this is not our users in general, but people on the internet, the majority of people are like they are in the physical world. It's a reflection of real life where people want to follow the rules follow the law, do what's right. It may be surprising because we're spending all our time trying to solve difficult challenges and problems, but the reality is people are, for the most part, following the law. So we also use teachable moments. We've redirected you or we've disabled a thing. Well, what just happened? Somebody needs to understand why couldn't I click on that and go somewhere? That way they'll learn what our member rules are. We'll let them know, hey, we disabled it. This was content that's not allowed. Or it was dangerous to you. It may have it contained virus or something like that. If we don't know what it is, and we do create white lists of things, or it's not on the blacklist, and you are going somewhere else off the site, we use that as another teachable moment. Take a minute, understand you're leaving our site, you could be going to some place that is fishing you or is dangerous in other ways. Now, if you choose to do so, you can. If you want to go back to the site, you can. You want to learn more, there's an opportunity to do that. We also want to introduce deterrence every step of the way. So for example, when you're uploading to the site, we'll grab in the red box, you'll see, we'll grab your IP address and we'll let you know that we are taking your IP address and we're gonna keep a record of it because if there is some conduct that's illegal in nature, we will work with law enforcement, we will disclose that information. This actually came to us, this concept from law enforcement directly, who said if you do this, you're gonna scare away the bad guys. And the number of images that are actually deleted on the site, the combination of adult pornography or, or um, extreme violence or things like that is so minuscule and small, it tells us that our users are following the rules. And in fact, we have users who tell us, oh, I didn't know we couldn't do that. Okay, I won't do it anymore. It's amazing how it's a reflection on real life once again. But we also know, and that's why notice and takedown hasn't gone away despite the new paradigm, that there are gonna be places where somebody may have gotten something through. So we have to provide our users the ability to let us know in places that matter. So if you're an image, look at all the red boxes that are on the screen. If you're an image, you can report this image. If you're in a video, you can flag it. If you're in a forum, you can let us know. If you're running an application, you can let us know this is causing an issue or things like that. These are all different places and we're looking for more places on the site as we grow to institute report abuse capabilities, which then goes to our 24-7 operations team to look at it, to review it, to take care of it, and take action. So what I've just said in the content side is in essence, we want to make sure we identify a, a image that violates our policy or video or content ahead of time. We want to make sure that you're not just going off to a place that may be bad in itself and find ways to do that and blacklist things. We want to deter you, we want to teach you as it's happening, and we want to give every user on our site the ability to let us know. And actually we go a bit beyond that, on the content and contact side. We're giving the ability to anyone who comes on our site the ability to tell us there's a problem. You don't have to sign up. And we do that because from our perspective, our users have people who care about them, and we want them to have the ability to say, well, wait a minute, I saw something on your site, I don't like it, I may not be a member, but my teen is a member, so at least they have the ability to still tell us. On the contact side, we start out with the notion that the first thing you should do is focus on the known bad. We made a policy decision. We are only, the only company in the world doing this right now. We have a proactive, zero-tolerance policy for convicted sex offenders on the site, and we built in conjunction with Sentinel Tech, I, I don't know if John Cardillo is still here, but a technology that runs 24-7, it looks through a bunch of criteria for registered sex offenders on the site. There's a team that works 24-7 looking at every result that comes back and says, oh, is that a registered sex offender? Let me compare on the right side up on your screen. That's the profile information that Sentinel provides us. And then we built a tool in-house for our, our support um, team to look at the profile on the right side. And the images they put up, they can click and they can go to the profile, they can make sure 
that this is a confirmed registered sex offender and then delete that profile, preserve it for law enforcement and let them take it from there. We run this 24 seven. This is not a one time hit we do. We don't rely just on our users. We, if we miss one, one of the greatest things again about our users is they will identify it and tell us. And when they do, we, we try to figure out what happened, what went wrong, why didn't we catch it? And there's a guy on my team whose job, anytime it comes in, is to go chase it down and say, was it a problem on the Sentinel end? Was it the government database wasn't good enough? Was it a problem in our review? And we constantly are trying to make sure that we're not missing things. We also focus on underage users. We don't want users who are, for example, 10 years old on our site. So we identify, we created algorithms. We watched how teens and kids talk to each other. And it's interesting because they want to be known just like um, our friend from Facebook was talking about. People want to be known a lot of times to their friends, so they will give you information. And we're running search algorithms 24 seven, looking for individuals who are telling us something more that than our, again, team goes through all the results and looks at who might be a 10 year old or an 11 year old, and those profiles are deleted. Next thing that we considered was how do we mirror and this happens everywhere on the site, the physical world of, world of safety and security into the online environment. And if we can't mirror it, how do we mold a new idea so that it reflects the real world? One of the things we're doing is, um, if you're a younger user on our site, the person who's an adult trying to befriend you or even send you a message can't do it unless they know your last name or your email address. Information you cannot find anywhere on the site because we don't publicly disclose, disclose it. So if there's somebody like Kelly wants to befriend me and I'm 13 years old, she can't do that because a pop-up will come up saying, I only accept friend requests or ad requests from people I know. You need to put that information in here. Another thing we do is we limit the ability for adults to browse for under 18. As an over 18, you can't even check in the browse area below 18. It start, starts at 18 and goes up from there, rather than giving you the ability to do anything below that. We limit who can see a minor. Not only browse for a minor, but who can see a minor. So all minors are defaulted that, si that are signing up to my friends only. In other words, they're private, their profiles are private, and under 16-year-olds are kept that way. Um, we limit who can see anyone on the site. We give you the ability to say, I don't want people to know when I'm lying. So check the box if you want them to, but otherwise you don't. And there's all sorts of really granular ways to create a world that you want reflecting your physical world. You may not want everybody to know you're on MySpace. You may want your friends from work. You may want your friends from home. You may want your friends from school. You can create these networks for yourself on the site and set the privacy settings the way you prefer them. For younger users, many of those are preset and many of them are locked because we've taken some proactive measures in those areas. We limit who can not only see you, but who can connect with you. You can set it up so that if you're 35 years on the, on the site and you only want people you know in the physical world to contact you, you can make it so that happens. You can make it so somebody can't send you a friend request without putting a capture up. One of these things has been a great way to reduce the spam on the site. And we've had a significant drop in our spam controls because of all the technology we put in, the bells and whistles that go off if something anomalous is happening on the site. I think Facebook was calling it karma, interestingly. We're developing karma as well and, and are even calling it that. Um, so I should write them a check or they should write me a check. Now we'll have that conversation later on whose idea it was. But in any case, the reality is, and you'll see this I think from other companies in the social networking and social media portal world, is that we're all looking at what we call reputational analysis, trying to understand what users are doing, what behavior is normal, anomalous, unusual, things that will trigger something is going on, staffer, go look at it, figure out what's going on, and take action. Or technology, this is gone way beyond what is considered normal, take action now to prevent any, any harm to other users very quickly, whether that's spreading spam or anything like that. Um, another thing we do to keep our minors protected is we lock the age on sign up so that the measures that we put in on safety 
remain with them and they don't explore or try to explore outside of that. Once again, like I talked about in the content area, we look for teachable moments. So when you're uploading images or videos, we put up a little, bar, look at the red box, we put up a little warning, let you know that other people can see what you're putting up. And what I, sell, what I actually tell a lot of school folks and, and teens is, look, if I ask you to come up here in front of a school stadium or a school assembly and Sally tell Jesse what you just said last night or what you did, if you're not willing to do that, don't put it on the site. And that's something that hits home because it's that real world experience that people have had. And they say, well, wait a minute. I never thought about it like that. Yeah, you're right. I won't do that. And we have those kinds of safety tips throughout the site. And we're inspiring people to understand, live your life online just like you do in the physical world. We also give minors tools, and we, these tools actually go with everyone, to stop cyberbullying. We were talk, somebody was asking about questions um, in the cyberbullying world. When you're posting, when your site is set up, you need permission to post a comment to another person's site. So when I receive a comment, which mine is set up like this, I can look at it and say, you know, this comment's not appropriate. It's mean, it may be nasty, it may be wrong, it may be misleading, or it just may mean something I don't want on my profile. I can say, nope, permission not granted, and the comment never appears. I also have the ability, and as every user on the site does, every teen on the site does, to block other users. I can check that box and I say, this person, Tom, you know what, I don't want them to connect with me, I don't want them to talk to me, I don't want them to do anything with me, block this user. Okay. We provide minors with a closed high school section where you have to be vouched for before you're allowed in. Um, this gives, gives our high school students a place to go to connect with other high school students who they know who belong to their high school. And, and very um, and cognizant of the fact that people have gone to high school and then graduated, they also want to be connecting with their high school alumni friends. We've created a special area for them separate from this. Um, deterrence. We looked at how we're trying to put in the tools to give to the user to empower them to take action. We've given things that we've done ourselves, but we also want to, at, at different places on the site, deter people from engaging in misconduct. For example, and again, this was working with law enforcement, we learned that if you verify email addresses, that sends a message to that potential bad guy, wait a minute, I'm, I'm using a verified live email address, whether it's Hotmail or it's Yahoo or it's AOL or it's whatever site there is out there, I also know those companies will maintain those records because that same type of messaging is coming from those companies. So if something does go wrong, we will provide it to law enforcement and we will move forward with that. One of the things we did on our site in, in conjunction talking to a lot of law enforcers out there is we went to a one-year subscriber and IP data policy. We will retain that information because we know it may take a while for an investigation to proceed. And at the same time, even if it goes beyond one year, we'll keep it as long as a police officer tells us they need it for an investigation. We also empower members. We want to give the power to the member to say, hey, something did go wrong. You missed one here. Let us know. So users can report abuse at the bottom of every single profile on the site. You have the ability. And users are great at enforcing member rules. It's no different than Community Watch. People like to let us know if there is an issue and we can handle it. And when they do let us know, we try to be as specific as we can. Tell us what you're talking about. Is it cyberbullying? Is it an imposter profile? We're actually expanding this. We're looking at all the different things we're doing in the report area, trying to make it more granular, more specific, and more directed to the right team who on the back end works 24-7 to get these things taken care of. Report abuse comes into play in contact as well. So if somebody sends you a note, you don't, you don't think it's appropriate, or there may be something wrong with it, or you think, hey, you know what, this, this, the MySpace folks need to know about it, they can let us know. There's abilities in places that matter. Okay. So if you look at what I've been talking about, there's an approach we're taking. It's holistic. It thinks about the user when they're getting on the site. It thinks about the user when they're doing things on the site, the contact, the content. All of those things, we're trying to deter people, use teachable moments, provide the opportunity to let us know. It's a combination of 
is a combination of proactive and notice and takedown, or what others have called reactive. All that being done, we also think it's really important to collaborate and partner with those who are also thinking about the safety and security of the community, whether it's a physical or the online. And frankly, nowadays, I mean, if you look at a teen, they're, they're online and in the offline world at any given time. They don't even know the difference. People like me, I'll sit at a computer, I'll look behind that computer and say, is it connected to the internet? My son one day said, what does that mean? Connected to the internet. In, he, in his mind, it's always connected. That's just the way life is, because he's never seen a modem before. And so that's how we have to think about this world. There's a lifestyle convergence that has happened, and we have to live in that world and always think about what's already been done for 200, 300 years for physical security, and what can we bring into the online environment and expand or mold or recreate it online. When something wrong does happen, 24-7 for law enforcement, we do not care if it's an emergency or not, we're there to answer that phone in three rings or less. And my staff kind of gets annoyed when I'll be on the road and I'll pick up the phone and I'll call. Just, and they'll be like, you know, law enforcement hotline, can I help you? I was just checking if you picked it up in three rings. Thank you, bye. But it keeps people on their toes. And it works. Law enforcement, we also recognize, needs to keep up with the times to see what's going on. And so we're training in person. We've already trained over 4,000 law enforcement officers. And we're doing this worldwide. We wrote an in entire guide for them and said, here's how our site works. Here's the information on it. Here's what you can get. Here's your two-page cheat sheet. If you're a detective, put it at your desk. Tape it up there. Before you call us, take a look. You'll know what to do. And that's the part we're doing to react to an issue that's occurred. There may be something that they're investigating. They need to contact us. But we're also looking at it from a proactive perspective. We know that there are gang members who are starting to go on the Internet. Before we hear about it on MySpace, we said, let's call and create an anti-gang task force. So we reached out to 26 different agencies in the country, and we started a phone conversation with them, and that turned into something much bigger now, where we're saying, what are you learning? And they're actually, actually going to be, LAPD is coming to see us, I think, in a couple weeks, and they're going to spend about four hours just teaching us how the gang environment works and what's going on in their world so that we can say, let's understand it, help our support people know what to do if there is an issue, proactively see what we can do to reduce anything from happening in the first place. One of the things that we've always thought was, as an industry leader, we don't want to just care about our users who are on MySpace. We want to care about the internet overall. So if you're on the site, you're also, um, I'll take two minutes and I'll close it, OK? Whenever, whenever he gets up, I get like, all right, time's up. <laughs> Collaboration not just with law enforcement, with experts. These are some of the, the, the uh, organizations around the world that we're working with to understand what issues may be happening. And again, what can we do proactively to stop it or deter it? We use teachable moments even here. If you, when you're signing up as an under 18, we have you read and click before you can get on the site through a bunch of safety tips. And we give you further information on that. Collaboration also means education to us. We wrote a guide for school administrators that went out to 55,000 schools. We wrote a guide for parents that's getting downloaded every day on our site and can be uh, gotten from in a physical form as well, as well as a teen guide. We worked with the National Center, all the different uh, people you see on the, on the left side. And then we said, you know, let's raise awareness, not just for internet users who are in MySpace, but for the community overall. We went to the FTC, partnered with them. They put a video on our site, which we featured. Got 785,000 users to see it. We also did a PSA called Don't Stop the Dialogue to say to parents, look, you've taught your kids in the physical world how to be safe and secure. You can also do it in the online environment. It's not that difficult. You just need to learn a little more about what to do. That reached 150 million users. It went through American Idol, doc, uh, um, American Idol on the television show. Every Fox broadcast and network station ran it. So that was a great endeavor for us. And we're going to continue in that line. We created a uh, safety site on, this, on the site itself that's interactive for anybody. You don't need to be a member. You can go to it. You can actually, I don't know if Stephen Bauckham is here. He's our featured expert right now. He's in the back. People are going to, I'm sure, going to inundate FOSI.org pretty soon. So he's going to have to get his servers ready. Um, but these are things for teens, for parents, for educators. We're making it as rich as we can. 
And then we said we heard from parents. I don't know if my kids are on your site. What do I do? We wrote a piece of software for them, gave it out for free. You can download it, you can put it on your PC at home, and you'll know if your kid is going to MySpace. And then one of the core beliefs we have, and I, uh, a lot of people have said this over the last few days, is parents are the first line of defense. In our world, parents are not only the first line of defense, but we respect their wishes. So if you have a 17-year-old at home and you don't want them on MySpace, contact us, let us know, we'll take care of it. And these are some of the things that we're doing in that direction. So just to close up, I'm going to revisit the three C's that we were talking about, content. If you look at everything we've been doing, it's what I consider a holistic approach. It's not something where one person can stand up and say, I've done this, we're done. We have to constantly look at what's going on in the community. We have to constantly look at new technologies that are emerging. Some of the companies yesterday that we're presenting, we're actually testing them. We're saying, is there something that can be done that you're offering that we can adopt and integrate? And that's why Kelly's been looking at it with open eyes all day yesterday. We're going to continue on this. I think you've often heard us say that internet safety for us is not a journey. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a destination, but it's a journey. And as long as our site continues to grow, as long as that we have users and new channels and new ideas coming up, we have to be the leader as the leader in the social media portal world in innovating in the technology in the safety and security world. Now, one thing as the last thing to say, I've often been asked, and this is happening a lot more now, I'll get a call from somebody saying, all right, so we're a new startup, we're small, but I heard you don't compete on safety. Which is true. You've heard me say this many, many times. If you've, if you've seen us out on the road anywhere, we do not compete on safety. You call us, we will help you. We'll tell you what we're doing. And a lot of companies have said, well, you have all these engineers. I think I was hearing that from a vendor yesterday. You've got so many engineers. Well, you know what? The reality is any company entering into the social networking or social media space can do certain things. And frankly, in our opinion, must do certain things in order to provide a safe and secure environment even just to their new users who are signing up and starting. Things that I put up on this, the basics you can do, and then continue and do, you know, I mean, when we started with Tom and Chris, it was a new site. We went from that to over 100 different safety features and innovations, ideas and programs we've implemented. And the AG agreement, I think 67 out of 68 of those have been accomplished already. And we're going to continue on this path um, as long as we exist as a site. But as a new company, there are things you can do. There are things that are relatively easy, and they make a big difference on content, contact, and in the collaborative world. Ima, thank you very much. Please join me. I appreciate this notion of holistic approaches, which I think is one thing as the task force we ought to figure out how to describe a holistic approach and stitching together many different measures, as you've demonstrated you are. I suspect there will be some questions. Uh, please. Um, my name is Danny. I'm from Been Verified. Um, I've actually got to experience the, the Don't Stop the Dialogue PSA, and I thought it was fantastic. So, Was it touching? It was supposed to be touching. Well, I'm sorry? I said, was it touching? It was supposed to be touching. Uh, yeah, I, I just thought it was a power. From a, from a messaging perspective, I thought it was, uh, it was, it was really smart. Are you um, an American Idol watcher? Actually, I'm not. I, I saw it on the internet. Um, my question is, is there a way to measure the effectiveness of these sort of PSAs? Um, has it been measured, you know, quantified, quality, and is there a way to do that? Will that be done in the future? I, I mean, I, I think a lot of the PSAs are being measured. Ad Council is a perfect example. If you look at Ad Council, they're constantly putting out PSAs, and that's because they do have an impact. If it drives people to act, and in our case, that call to action was very simple. Go to ikeepsafe.org and learn more. I got a call from the executive director of ikeepsafe.org, Marsley Hancock. When that PSA ran, she said, the PSA must have just run. I'm getting calls all over the place. Our, our network is getting emails. Wow, I didn't know that could happen. Right? And that was a great immediate reaction to a PSA running on television. What, what I found more interesting was the PSA ran and instead of watching the rest of the show, maybe that's not good for Fox, Fox television perspective, but people were going online and emailing ikeepsafe.org for getting more information. So from just that anecdotal perspective, I think the answer is absolutely yes. The second, though, from Ad Council, and I would 
urge you to go to the Ad Council website and learn about all the different things they're doing because we're partnering with them on creating PSAs for the safety and security of environment. Okay. Ken, go ahead. Just keep talking a little bit. Glinden Lab. <laughs> Thanks, Hamer. That, that was very, um, very insightful, very valuable. Um, I especially appreciated that you talked a little bit about deterrence, which is something that we haven't discussed that much here as, as a task force, but I think it's, it's, it's an important piece of this. Um, I know it's important to law enforcement, and I, I've also always sensed that, you know, word gets around among bad guys about what, you know, how watchful a site is and what, what's being retained, for instance. And um, my question is, I, I noticed you, you talked a little bit about what uh, data gets retained, and I've always noticed there's some tension between uh, the law enforcement authorities who are always pushing us to, to retain more and more information, which many of us like to do, and on the other hand, privacy advocates and, and privacy commissioners, especially in the EU, who, who kind of go the other way. And I'm just wondering if, if uh, MySpace has um, you know, how you've resolved this or, or what uh, pushback uh, you've gotten on, on either end. So your, your question is something that we were debating in DOJ 15 years ago. And it's going to be like that all the time. But I think one thing people need to understand <clears throat> and our users understand is there's a difference. There's, they're not mutually exclusive, privacy versus data retention or security, which I, I think a lot of people think that, well, you're retaining data, that's violating my privacy. No, it's a relatively simple concept. We just need to explain to you what it is we're keeping, how long we keep it, and what do we do with it. And as a member, you have our member policies to understand it. You have our poli privacy policies. But one thing we did was we went out to the law enforcement community, and we're also talking to the privacy community. And one of the things that I think people feel comfortable about is the data doesn't just get disclosed willy-nilly. It gets disclosed in response to a legal request, whether it's a subpoena, it's a search warrant, things like that. We also learned from the law enforcement community how much time it takes for them to conduct an investigation. Having been a prosecutor, that part I could connect with very quickly and understand the pain that they were going through. And the third is, um, actually, I said two things, so I'm not going to say a third. <laughs> <laughs> lawyers are trained at law school to say things in threes, right? So you naturally right. felt, they, as a non-scientist and lawyer, they um, teach we'll you that to, in moot that court. There are always three things. That's right. We'll go to Blair in one sec, but just one note, Ken. I'll be very interested. Does that answer your question? Oh, sorry. Was that it, response? It, it does. Except I, I was taught in moot court that there should always be three. Um, okay. Before going to Blair, just one note. You know, you gave the sense that the Europeans. Um, may be giving you a different message uh, at, from the Commission perspective. I'm curious, in a year from now, when the EU data retention directive starts to get implemented at the state level, whether you'll be saying the same thing. There's obvious tension there between you know, the, um, uh, the privacy directive and data retention, but it may well be that the European bar is actually higher than the U.S. Uh, you know, after well, that. I'll, I'll add a third yeah. based on that. All right, um, there we go. We got there. Okay. Right. That's the good. Third, Socratic actually, method in action. What's interesting is that the European Commission or Union asked countries in Europe to retain data for one year. Actually, they said from six months to two years. And we have so far chosen one year because it seemed the UK said one year in their country. US, there is no law right now, but I know DOJ is thinking about two years. But the more we look at it, we focused on who you are, where you are, and what you do or say, what you say. And who you are and where you are is more important and more critical to law enforcement when they're doing their initial investigation to know, is this person in my country, my jurisdiction, and then I can proceed from there. And that actually takes care of the majority of the issues that are facing law enforcement. And also, because it's not what you say, it helps on the privacy side. Great. Blair. Oh, thanks. Uh, Blair Richardson from uh, <laughs> Aristotle. Um, I had a question about your new paradigm and uh, proactivity slide. Um, and actually, before I start, I wanted to say a lot of these controls look very helpful, and I want to commend you on them, particularly with respect to immediately contacting law enforcement when you get an imminent suicide threat. Uh, that's really important. I wanted to ask you the same question that I asked um, Facebook, which uh, I, you understand is that um, when you learn that someone is a uh, registered sex offender, do you proactively look to see if they have been contacting minors? 
and when miners have been contacted, whether it, it's wanted or unwanted, uh, what's your policy on notifying the miner, parents, NICMEC, law enforcement, uh, proactively? Essentially the same question I asked Facebook. So I, I think you actually raised a question that ties right back to the paradigm question, which is what we did is we created a technology with Sentinel to proactively identify individuals versus other companies. We're not waiting for somebody to tell us, hey, there's a guy on your site. He may have been there for a year, he may have been there for two years, and he's a registered sex offender. We're running, when you sign up as a user, we're running this technology on a 24-7 basis doing an analysis, and then we have a 24-7 team that looks at the results, as, uh, and we try to do it as quickly as we can so that when you've signed up, you don't get much opportunity to do much on the site, number one. Number two, we're letting law enforcement know about this even if they have not done a single thing wrong in our site. And we're providing that information to law enforcement. So now you have law enforcement officers who have the ability to see what that individual has done based on the information we provided and conduct an, in an investigation. In those situations where we think that somebody is on the site, is a registered sex offender, or even who's not a registered sex offender, we don't want to limit it to that, and there seems to be some anomaly Maybe they're befriending too many kids. Maybe they've been blocked or rejected by too many kids. We're not going to call the law enforcement um, office directly. We're going to call the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children because they've created a hotline with us for exactly that purpose. And then they will conduct their investigation, farm it out to whatever agency might be in the world, and go from there. Okay. Do you have a sense of how many people uh, on MySpace of all your members have signed up with their real names? No, but that's why we're using all the different controls. That's why we're giving power to the users. That's why we're, we're also very quickly seeing that users are wanting to be known just like they are in the physical world. Okay, okay. thank you. Teresa. Um, Polytechnic University. Okay. I wanted to ask what is the most difficult problem that you are dealing with and the one that you view as most pressing to protecting children when they're using your site? I actually think the uh, most pressing challenge that we have is perception. And that's not we, the company, MySpace, but we, the industry. Because there has been, I think, and we're learning this more and more as we go through our task force, <clears throat> a misconception out there on what problems need to be solved and I think as an industry, we need to be focused more on identifying the true problems and finding ways to solve the, those problems or those challenges. More specifically, on the site itself, I think the greatest challenge, not just MySpace, but every company frankly has, and this is tied to the data we're learning, which is there are at-risk teens out there. And those people who are at-risk in the physical world are just as at-risk in the online world. And that's, an, I think, an eye-opener for many people. And our greatest challenge is how do you proactively identify an at-risk teen so that you're protecting that individual, creating intervention before something can go wrong. And I, frankly, I think that's one of the greatest challenges we have in society when you're raising teens is if they're at risk, how do you know? Is there a counselor who figures it out? Is there a teacher who understands? Is there a friend who's willing to say intervention? And can you do something on the site itself and that's why I think putting a lot of these controls in place and the ability to tell us quickly, the 24-7 team that responds, it helps, but usually it means something's happened to that at-risk team, and our goal is to say, how do we find a way to identify them early, whether it's going to people like Ann Collier and saying, can you deploy a bunch of sociologists out there to look at our site and identify somebody whose profile you might see, and Dana suggested this one point, there are people who can look at a profile and possibly say, I think that person's at risk. Well, if there are people out there who are listening who can do that, tell us. We have that 24-7 capability to respond, but I think that's one of our biggest challenges. Thanks, Simu. Do you mind if we keep you up there for two more and then go to a break? Three more. Three more. All right. Three more. Good man. Um, uh, great. Then I'll reserve the last one for John. So we'll go uh, Net Nanny, John Morris. Uh, I'm going to go with John just because he hasn't had... Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Himachu, for your presentation. It was excellent. I'm Peter Ferrioli from NetNanny. Um, just a couple quick questions. You've talked about a lot of uh, 
things that you do for extreme behaviors and extreme situations on MySpace. What about the situations have you considered, what do you do about terms of service violations, about banning IPs, about stopping people from setting up 200 accounts on MySpace when they're banned from their first account, and some of the issues like that that you deal with with the minimal barrier to um, set up a MySpace page? We actually do quite an extensive, I mean, it'll probably take me two hours to tell you the different things we're doing. Maybe um, after the task force meeting? But I can, I can do that after the meeting too. But in essence, the way we approach it is there are member rules that you have to follow. And we take, I think we're known as taking pretty harsh action, even you know, against members for violating those rules. We try to give you an understanding of what just went wrong and why you, were, you, you, know, why you may be deleted or why you can't do something. We let you know we use those as teachable moments. But if, you think, if we think a user is acting in a way that's not appropriate for the site, we will delete that user. But deleting the user for us isn't just, oh, your account's been deleted. Every message you've sent to somebody is deleted. Every group you've joined is gone. Every group you've created is gone, rather. So your existence on the site is disintegrated. And that's a major punishment to somebody who may be on the site and saying, oh, I have, you know, I've set up my blog. I've done all of these things. I've created a whole world that's reflective of my physical world. And all of a sudden, you have to start all over again. So that's the kind of thing that we look at is, and that's why teachable moments become critical. The second on the IP thing, and this is a question that a lot of people are asking, can't you block the IP? But as long as they're dynamic IPs that are not tying one to one, there's no way to do that. I think ADAPT had a good idea yesterday, which we're gonna explore, is how do you create you know, a fingerprint of that system? But on the other hand, you have that issue of if you have five users on this one computer at home, what do you do for that one person who's, you know, why can't you be like your brother, right? That issue. And just the, the simple follow-up is, super, super okay, short. have you considered just not allowing anyone to sign up with web-based email accounts, having to have an actual ISP email account? No, because I think web-based email accounts are very mature nowadays when, versus the way they were when, you know, 15 years ago. And a lot of these companies that have web-based emails are keeping data like subscriber and registration data. They're keeping IP logs. So if law enforcement actually needs something, they have the ability to go from us to that next thing, and we'll teach you how to go get it from the other person as well. Great, so we'll go John Morris and John Dan Larry, you get the first question in the following session, if that's okay, because we've got a discussion <laughs> session after this. Very quickly, the same question I posed to um, Facebook. I mean, do you have any evidence, any information about any users you might be losing because you're too restrictive, people who want more open um, environments, and, and do you have any sense as to where they might be going? Really, the question is, where might young people be going if, um, if they're not on Facebook? I, I think you're actually raising a point that may be partly a misconception issue. One of the things to understand is that people don't go to sites to get themselves in trouble. They're going there because they're enjoying the world just like they do in the physical world. People go to the mall because they want to shop, not because they want to get ripped off by somebody. Same thing happens when you're going on the internet or on our site. You're coming here and you have certain expectations that you're going to be taken care of, that you know, you're going to have a safe and secure environment in which to operate. That's number one. Number two, we're seeing statistically that the decision people are making about which site to go isn't, I'll go to MySpace, therefore I won't go to Facebook, or therefore I won't go to Cafe Mom, or therefore I won't go to High Five. What you're actually finding is cross-pollination. People who are on High Five or Facebook or Cafe Mom are also on MySpace. So people are exploring different things for different uses. So you may want to have your college life in one area, but you may want to have your, your other life in another area or another part of your, your daily life in another area. And you may use different sites for different purposes. One of the things we found is the majority of the people, and this is more of a business thing, find or consider what going to MySpace as their home base, but they're also going to explore other areas. What, um, so I don't think it's a question of where are they are going. It's a question of where are they as well. And you'll find that throughout the site, whether you're dealing with teens or adults. John Dentsu, last question. John Dentsu, Ideology. Um, so some of, the, some of the rules that you all have relative to access, for instance, an adult, a parent being able to tell a child not to use the site, a sex offender and so forth, rely on verified identities and using real information. Um, so I'm, I, you know, we heard from Facebook some of the steps that they're taking to verify identity. Um, can you give us some information on the things that you're doing to verify identity 
from that perspective? And also, how do you know that 89% of your users are 18 and above? Well, that's a ComScore, ComScore metric, actually, which the entire industry relies on, number one. The second thing is um, we have to look at this from two perspectives. One is there are many people who want to be known and want to be connected to communities of people that are known. There are also people who want to have a different life on the, on the site, not because they're going to do something wrong, but because that's the experience they choose to have on the Internet. We have to take the approach in safety and security that takes into account both of those situations and put in an infrastructure that will be able to handle both, just like it is in the physical world where you're not going into Starbucks and before you enter, you have to go through an ideology verification system. So that's how we approach our site. Um, and that's how we're going to continue to do it. And I, and I will tell you, I mean, verification is easy to overcome. I have a fake account on Facebook myself. And I've made friends with people I don't know. And I'm sure a lot of people do as well. All right. So um, let's take a short break. But first, thank uh, Himu for uh, his presentation.